An excerpt from Cross Purposes. The kingdom of God is within you, Patrick. The external space-time, temporal ecstasis is material, and contingent being subject to alterity, even through the simple Einsteinian categories of general and special relativity without universe re-engineering by temporal sentient design. For some of the more driven, the tabula rasa or blank slate of universal background non-being is a temptation. For the devil, a fallen angel, given everything ima imaginable, a created being that exists for himself, evidently failing to understand that the created is a special category from the creator, rather than the whole of the creator, on which level a created being might be an actual peer, able to revolt and take the number one job. This is a recurrent theme throughout human history, Patrick. The created wishes to become external for themselves in the originally created universe, or in universes existing with an original source derived from original spin from the first no-brain emanation. I asked Elisha Kane if there was a direct causal teleological link of my transitions from an earth beingness into the Higgs or scalar fields and temporalizations at places such as New Babylon. Elijah replied, If you mean, am I able to correlate your transition from an earth normal status to the Higgs field way of being, I cannot. The earth and universe one normal time experience was a place where Christians lived and believed that the end times of the age of the Gentiles would occur with an apocalypse and a rapturous removal of believers into other space-time criteria following. Even so, I cannot delimit the space-time locales into particular and definite parameters upon the basis of my own reading of the Bible and personal experience. Dead reckoning indicates for me that with the kingdom of God being within and God being eternal, while the created material universes are temporal, salvation and the purpose and plan of the universe may have a more conditional subjective component in both space-time and experience. The parameters Jesus mentioned aren't necessarily inconsistent with a variety of possible universes singularly in composition or with space-time selections from a number of possible universes. Given a set of modal logic criteria drawn from what the Lord said as reported in the four books of the Gospel, I wish I could be of more help. Elijah, you know, I search for the absolute truth because it concerns my very existence within the Higgs or scalar field and actualizes a variable on occasion temporarily upon a world of temporal constants changing in the very nature of existence as evolving permutating elements in a universe flow of virtual force fields borrowed from an initial Higgs or scalar singularity. I understand that, Patrick. Elisha Kane looked across the high plane at the distant focus. He said, my own actualization here isn't much understandable for me either, Patrick. I've accessed library archives in Swambia, providing extracts of the accumulated database New Babylonians compiled from a variety of sources, some of which are extra-universal in origin, that have helped explain the science and logic of the relation of the temporal to the eternal and the particular universes to the possibilities of all possible universes, producible by natural inevitability or necessity or through scientific breakthrough, human free will from the natural determinism implicit in the flow of non-sentient space-time matter. Non-sentient free will would be an oxymoron, yet you may yourself testify that the Higgs field is a place where sentience may exist. So where is such a thing as pure natural mass following inertial laws of nature to be found? For the past actualizations here, I have experienced a time passage of one new Babylonian year. Incidentally, Patrick, there is another one from Earth that has actualized here, and the last time he arrived in an alien spaceship that crash-landed in a cove in Swambian, southeast Alaska. His name is Quintus. Kane seemed preoccupied and restless. We stood near some old elm and cottonwood trees near a brook passing from the land. Beyond us, a mile away, a 600-foot-tall butte rose from the floor of the broad valley. The plain itself was several thousand feet above sea level. The ship rock was designed as an off-world long-shoring port for extraterrestrial lighter-than-space-time blimps. Opposite to the northwest, a dust storm grew. A small brown smudge in the horizon increased. Kane talked about Quintus. He invented the political ceremony of devotion on the old earth during the formative period of the Roman M Republic, centuries before the birth of Christ. Rome wasn't much more than a single city. Its tribe grew to challenge neighboring tribes of the Italian peninsula. 
In the depths of one war, the Romans experienced military setbacks, pushing to the brink of defeat. Political leaders in those times were close to the people and not only fought with them, they led. Quintus was such a leader. The moment was such that turning the tide of battle required that he make the ultimate sacrifice himself. Quintus devoted himself ceremoniously the night before battle to die in the next morning's fight. At dawn, with the opposing armies arrayed on the field of battle, he singly charged the enemy and fought rather well with sword in hand, slashing opponents until he fell in death. The Roman army was inspired by the example of Quintus and charged in a similar manner, slaughtering their foes. The growth of the Roman Republic to conquer all of Italy and beyond followed. Quintus at times seemed to be a bit zealous in this tunnel vision devotions to political causes, and yet that may have its good as well as bad side. On New Babylon with an amorphous enemy that politically disinterpreted vague constitution to suit his its treacherously evil disposition, charging like a bull into a midst of such an opponent may not be a good idea. The concept is somewhat difficult to convey to some, yet in my conversations with Quintus I believe I have gained some ground. I asked, what are the politics of New Babylon, Elisha? Let me say a word about the basic nature of human politics, Patrick. It is fascist and collectivist. Fascist power and force are the essential organizing principles of human beings. It is less apparent in homogeneous groups as might the speed and gravitational force of an object traveling at a constant speed. Fascism is the will to power of any in-group with a cohesive identity over out-groups. Rival fascist allegiances of unequal powers may compete yet remain fascist. Polemics and propaganda and even constitution may arise to bind fascist rival groups and pacts for peaceful coexistence. Yet fascism isn't bound to race or gender groups or that of any other than a cohesive mass social organization will to power. Fascist elements in a constitutional government with nominal civil rights slip the noose of decency and reform into new fascist social groups with new in-group and out-group members. Mass broadcasting slipped fascism out of legal boundaries. State fascism calls itself freedom, and then in times of international fascist rivalries include those of communist and capitalist governments ruled by ad hoc fascist organizational elites. The globe becomes a unitary fascist polity with one absolute fascist party purging the in-group of out-group members. It is always necessary for enemies to exist for justification of emergency powers. Original sin transforms the occasional political will for honest democratic government, sometimes lighting upon reformers and rebels and the treacherous, pervasive fascist leadership. It is that worldly political evil that seeks to rebel even upon itself that the Christian is challenged to overcome. The devil is the ruler of the world politically who controls mass social organization through the weight of social sin. On New Babylon, evil has sought new methods of corruption to perpetually revolt against honesty and justice and boldly corrupt everything never corrupted before. Bamelik became a synonym for the devil. The universe that New Babylon exists in has been itself modified to permit the increase of evil beyond its mortal limits. It is needful to be wary of the infinity of snares on New Babylon that go beyond the more obvious direct assaults from the forces of the beast you may encounter here. I am beginning to fade, Patrick. I grow light-headed as this next unanticipated recall to nowhere known draws near. Be in the spirit, Patrick. Godspeed, Elijah. I just had time to say before he disappeared like a memory from my mind. A distinct menacing sound of humming began to rise in the general direction mm, of the increasing close reddish-brown cloud of dust. A sound like thundering hooves clapped a syncopated din. I was to perhaps receive my first encounter with Swambian life, larger than inoculated mosquitoes. The approaching evil were Posenian, deconstructionist plasm snoggers, ravenously reaching for the smell of fresh prey. As I moved in closer, I was able to discern their numbers in twin wings of two hundred each. The horde moved in mindless, emotionless hunger to eat a target dead or alive. An ordinary plasm snogger is made up of 99% human DNA reassembled in the most denigrating yet utilitarian manner possible without a sentient brain, and usually are guided by a programmable consumer logic from a beast control quantum cast. Implicit inertial guidance control biochips sometimes are allowed to enable quasi-autonomous movement with limited decision-making capability. They have stout legs with the upper thorax, for lack of a better word, that ended flat and broad, encompassed in midsection by an omnivorous mouth. 
They had strong, upreaching troll arms. The thorax was somewhat amoebic and guts luminously behind an opaque shell designed to input and digest biomass as quickly and efficiently as possible. It isn't simple to guess where they just started this particular mission from, or even if I was a primary target or a secondary morsel of opportunity, it was obvious that just a few hundred seconds remained before the herd's vectors closed the interval. Therefore, I quit my circumspection of these new Babylonians and looked askance for defensive inspiration. It was thus, in a timely way, that I first met Quintus landing by a sail parachute in front and to my right with a pair of active diamond-edged sonofusion cutlasses, one of which he tossed to me handle first. At the leading edge of the plasma snoggers, barreling in close, Quintus enthusiastically began cutting and slashing with effortless skill the right wing, and I emulated as best as possible the example upon the plasma snoggers on the left. We fought the plasma snoggers for minutes as the day drew down, and the DCS's reflection rays moved toward oranges and purple, dicing and slicing the purely sensory-capable eating warriors, painlessly reduced blow after blow from the sizzling fusion swords, clear-cutting through nearly anything, was arm-wearing work drawing down as the numbers of the enemy declined from our ceaseless defense, deleting the remaining able from their ranks methodically. Well, Patrick, Quintus reported, saying something for the first time since arriving. The Bin Bamalik of this federated new Babylon has spent his first sense data investigators on you. In a small way, he has incrementally added to the debt of the evil empire and strengthened the kitsch of the netherworld realm of debts below the surface of the waters of Pacifica. Every debt counts, Voivoda. Perhaps the debts of the tyrant's realm will lead to its dissolution. I'm not sure of that, Quintus. I believe some tyrants run up a nation's debt, letting the chaos of war and government replacement liquidate the debt. Possibly it is so, Patrick, yet best not a method for small worlds without the uh, without off-world travel arrangements besides that duh. Elijah Kane told me something about you, Quintus. Thank you for being here. In time to slay the plasma snoggers. No problem, Patrick. The pleasure is mine. Helios, fog drifts in still motion spiral, settling upon dusk's physical prowess, eyes searching themselves everywhere. Ben Bamlik's pools of pleasure fuel our droughts, brought a bloodlust of avarice and intensification of the will for geopolitical power over New Babylon. Rising from a sub-mountain headquarters in Skirville, it being both male and female as the pleasure suited it, forced through a waveform conquest on New Babylon, making a federation of the damned from Initial complacent, if not cooperative populace, unwilling to risk conflict with an arising corrupt ruling authority. The new Babylon corruption by Bamlik was a fait accompli, and few people remained with the will to make their own private war upon the tyrant and his legions of the damned. Willow Strange made it to the doorway, breathless. Everything was changed in the gathered darkness after a deep evening swirling unto its brain. Rain began to fall, plopping into fizzling in the protest and the surreal conclusion in her recent daydream about a walk about. Large, clear beads were driven inside before the wind evaporated the wet condensations of time. Wind raced circuitously through a variegated forest stand of receding timbers swirling over the deep green arbor carpeted by evergreen needles. It was endangered by the pathological reap of Bamlik's anti-life corruption sweeps. The shelter of the ancient forest yielded to a natural clearing, providing easy targets for the scouring wind. The rubber over the hill surrounded the game of two-story rusty, synthetic stick gray pulpit, willow fading, tricolored paint covered a theme from another space-time as unremarkable as dirt. Time for ebbing, time for life is ebbing, she thought, feeling the cold flow of chilled blood tracking, tricking down into her heart. Isn't it possible to continue to exist in this evil of Ben Bamlik is an illusory thing for itself in some way that will poof into usual delusional sadedness of government nightmare? She slumped down in the open doorway, resting her back on one side of the frame, then suffered the extra pain to brush her long raven hair from her eyes. The shoulder was a blinding pain for itself, ligaments torn and parted beyond the rotator cuff, it was an agony-compelling detachment of mind so far as was possible in order to let her select steps making her way home. I shared her pain later when I learned of the injury. She wrote a book with her to the door with its cover missing. The title page read, Thomas Malthus and the Argument Against Utopian Environmentalism. It seemed like a subject worth thinking about. 
The day was an infinity of large moments that expanded into colors of suffering and thermal relationships. The environment, she regarded, was beautiful, except when it was unhealthy, slaughtered, or dead. The swine plasm spare body part shipment of thoraxes was approaching in a convoy of Swambian Global Stooge utility vehicles hovering over a Meisner superconductor cable on Swambian Coast Highway 5. Another slaughterhouse harvest of humans for life extensions of Bin Bamalik special plasm snoggers was nearing an unscheduled termination. Grotesquery was the preferred design motif for Bin Bamalik's hove trucks. At least the many nutrition incentive umbilical cord streaming staff hove truck flying several black flags to trailing vehicles reminded Willow of a sadistic annihilation of normal human reproductivity for biosynthetics. Thermite pyroclastic sonobomb shaped into a well configured overburden transducer she placed converted the vehicle motion recognition sensor data into an electric detonation signal fireballing the engineered stem cell clone plasma snogger force vehicles into a beautiful disaster for those with a mark of the beast to scrutinize for Ben Bamlick, even if not a very substantive debit onto his annual profit loss, Book of the Dead. It was such a beautiful disaster, she thought, with the cascading implosive shock waves liquidating so many plasm snogger clones. Willow tried to surface other more detached pleasures through the insanely repressive world of pain that had overtaken her. The prospect for human freedom and eventually for human existence slipped away through accumulations of biomedical alterations to the human form and space-time actualization of the genomic phenomenalities and by detachment of humanity's place in nature. Some prior government conquered by greed transformed its population into a wallow of materialist swine, a morally compelled to consume and yield all individual political and intellectual independence, making it easy for Ben Bamlick and the beast to surge into power and consolidate absolute control, or sort, sort of nearly. Willow and others yet <clears throat> resisted the destruction of humanity in a natural environment. She knew she must go from the home just 100 miles from her victory. Blood snoggers would find their way here, considering how much sign was left in the recovery from the landslide after things went wrong and she was caught in rock fall herself. Willow got up, gripping the door frame, and began cautiously to move away from the porch of the house. There was a path through the clearing leading to a public electromagnetic accelerator stationed downhill in the river district of New Combinville. She moved through the clover, clover on an uncertain forced march, Vector feeling disorientingly faint with the wind and rain whispering a private message. Suddenly she was spun around, slammed breath-taking body punch, exploding impacts of a door gunner's sonal bubble rifle blast directing Shaped, confined sound form shredding her tall, soft body, Willow perceived a surreal black cutout uniform killer hanging by a harness from the rectangular space-time coordinate hunter-killer insertion epiphenomenalized above the forest with last twilight over Pacific Swambia and the coast. Mountains to the west, as she fell to the ground, the space-time insertion was vaporized by an antimatter grenade, and the strong right arm of Quintus arrested her collapse through her consciousness had shifted into another world of the detached, reflective cogito. Can you see the relevance of challenging that is said or written, if it applies to this moment or even the future, then it must have some meaning? Categorization of genus and species of objects, of language, of the abstract and of reference, of more concrete ideas. Is there such a thing as meaning without such? Is the being of man-made constructions and environmental constructions as primary or essential as nature for itself is meaningless because of its recursive implicit categorization as a concrete meaning does it lose its natural value as an essential in itself if everything is truly nature then it follows that everything that is said or thought occurs as in a dream with meaninglessness or to humanity contingent to phenomenal placement within the teleology of the prime universe's initial creator Everything that truly is primary or essential exists for itself without contingent primary meaning as a human language categorical actualization. The entire world created by mankind is a contingent project of illusory mental products, constructs, predicted, predicated by the ego. That which he orders in the material world has an initial order for itself that isn't altered by the shapes mankind may give to various aspects of it. Are you an environmentalist or not? Do you think that phenomenality lost fate, Joss fate in human constructions imposed upon the essential for itself as a necessary superficial or transcendental role of being? 
Is life a lie, or does it have true value without illusion? Can one be an animist, a pantheist, or apocalyptic millenarian deist and equally regard the world in which you live, cautious my soul? I have referred to myself now as a single other second person. The way that the sentient anarchist political drone, sentient Bin Bamalikian, slave nihilist, DC demon, Taoist thought shaper, or the unwounded do. In this river of questions, I have a thousand dreams a second. They are all surfaces drawn into the same world, the world of oneness the dreamer leaves beyond. Descartes followed the advice of Socrates to know thyself, and he felt certain that because he knows that he could be certain of his existence as what he inwardly perceived, cogito ergo sum, Hamlet perchance to dream and found instead that therein is the rub, running into sensation becomes the relation of thought to experience, registration of sense data, in virtual memory, compounded several times over into complex ideation, is given a completely contingent and illusory nature, only seeming to be real, even if really dreamt. The argument becomes circular. How could you ever break out of ontological tautology or existential epistemological contingents enough to stipulate the arrival of real being in itself? To be is to be, and becoming you must also, though it does often seem so narrow onto a dead-end road. Thought cannot communicate with non-thought. Mind does not communicate with matter. There is no outside to the universe of space-time, yet there is non-space-time beyond the universe. There is no outside to personal experience, yet there is other than personal experience outside one's own. In which this world flows is the feeling that Hume could have described as an effect. All effects are contingent relationships of an abstract conceptual character describing some empirical transition. Cause has no sensation without will or sense registers. All sensations are effects of empirical sensory registers. Hume wrote that cause and effect doesn't exist at all. Bishop Barclay wrote that the causes of sensations are non-contingent creations of the absolute ideal of God for us. In a sense, all human experience is, at least in the opinion of some idealists, a continuing revelation of the divine plan unfolding in actuality. Willow wasn't especially philosophical, I began to realize, yet the sono bullets tearing up her gut suddenly had compelled her detachment from ordinary pain and sense continuity. Quintus and I carried her on a hover litter toward the river and into the underground world of kitsch depths for transport to the area of battle beyond.